want to sing a nigun. This is a nigun of uh, a dear friend of mine, Rabbi Avram Willick. It's a beautiful nigun I've been singing since he just put out this, album, this beautiful new album. Uh, there are a lot of words. I'm just going to sing without the words. Very simple nigun. Deepest nigun.
This nigga for me is like uh, it's like air because I feel like there's pe- there's so many n- new albums, new nigga name, and but then once in a while you you learn a nigga that you f- a you feel like it was meant just for you, and b is that it's oxygen. It's like okay, I could I could keep on doing whatever I have to be doing right now, but this only because I have new oxygen in there, and it actually connects to what we learned a few weeks ago about uh, truly inhaling. Most of us just. Most of us don't really breathe, or when we breathe, we're not really aware of it. But inhaling is always new air. You don't usually inhale the same exact air that you just let out. It's suffocating. So what does it mean when you inhaling new air? That's what it means, kol neshama, like we learned, kol neshama, tahalel kal, kashon, kalen, kol neshima, shima. Every single breath should feel like new. So alivai, kakam, there's a lot of space up here. We saved it just for you guys also, so. Anyway, it's so good to have a nigga that gives you air. That's basically what it is. All right. So, welcome everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone for joining and for coming tonight. Um, perfect. This is this is um, a big schus every time that we kind of finish. Um, every time we finish a sefer, every time we, we begin a new sefer, and every time we finish a sefer, something beautiful happens. If you really tuned in to the secrets of the parsha, you get when you start a new sefer. When you start Breshit, obviously it feels new. When you start Shmot, it feels new. When you start Vayikra, it feels new, although you know it's going to be a little bit uh, not as exciting as learning Bab Reshit, because now it's about, okay, so that sacrifice is brought then, and that sacrifice is brought then. You start Bab Midbar, a bit more exciting. You start Dvarim, it's, wow, okay, now it's a repet- repetition. If you are in- tuned into the secrets of the Torah, then you know that every single Sefer starts off with something very strong to give you to go on to the journey of the Sefer. But what do we do? When we end the Sefer, what do we say? When we end the Sefer, Chazak, Chazak, Menit Chazak. Which means strong, strong, and let's get strong. Let's get strong from all that we just learned in this Sefer, and let's carry it in to the next Sefer. What's the end of Sefer Bereshit? You need, a, you need to really get strong, because we know that the end of Bereshit is the beginning of exile. It's when we first go down into Egypt. Towards the end of Bereshit, especially the end, we go down to Mitzvah, so okay, chazak, chazak, venit chazak, which really means let's get strong from every story we learned in Sefer Bereshit. Let's really let it strengthen us. Let us take every story we learned. Let us take every Rashi we learned. Let's take every parable of the Baal Shem that we learned. Let's take everything we learned. Chazak, chazak, venit chazak, and now move along. Now let's move on to Shmot. Begin Shmot, Ve'ele Shmot B'nei Yisrael Abayim Yitzrayma. Shmot is known as Sefer HaGeulah, the Book of Redemption. And now here we are, Parashat Pikude. What's exciting about Pikude? In fact, it's usually almost never on its own, right? Because it's a leap year, so we have Pikude on its own. But how do you end off Sefer Shmot and feel excited? Parashat Pikude, the Mishkan. The Mishkan. I want to be really real, okay? <laughs> who really got really? Who really ever got turned on by the by talking about the Mishkan? Right. Come on. So, <laughs> having said all that intro, the Chovet Purim, I want to continue the learning tonight. For I was waiting for one more name, but just to have in mind for the Rafur Shlema of of uh, a dear friend of mine, of Eliel Haber's daughter, Shav Rafur Shlema, little girl, heart. And for our dear friend Reb Nassim Daniel Ben Malka, Reb Siegel, Shlomo Mendel Ben Rachel, Shoshana Ressa Bas Ahuva, and for Michal Moshe Zeev Ben Yehudis, and another very close dear friend, Alte Baruch Ben Sara. Mayor of Sarah. Oh yeah, Mayor, Mayor Nisim, uh, Mayor Nisim Ben 
Ben Rach, I think you're right. Yeah, oh, Reb Merab Chotzer, another old friend, yeah. And um, we continue also, Lilui Nishmas Miriam Bat Eliyahu Zechariah Ben Yaakov Eliezer Ben Eliyahu Aryeh. And also, I want to mention this week was my grandmother's Yorzeit, and I ch- we, we all checked it out. Yorzeit, there's a machlokas, whether it's you do it in other Aleph and other Bet, so most people hold that you commemorate it in both. If that usually entails you doing a crazy wild trip with a bunch of people to fly out somewhere to be at the Kever, you don't have to do that twice <laughs> each month. But my grandmother's yard site was this past Friday, and I guess it will be again next month too, 16 years ago. My grandmother's Chaya Racha Bas Tzvi Hirsh. I want to do this learning, and if I would start talking to you about my grandmother, then we would, we would really not get to any learning tonight. Um, I could just tell you that she thought that I was Mashiach. So, anyway, come. So, I guess so. Uh, can you open up the door a little bit? Thank you. If anyone, if it gets too cold, let us know, but usually people complain it's too stuffy, so open the window a little bit. Okay. Having said everything that we said in the beginning, I want to ask uh, something very uh, very personal to everybody, and you don't, it's, again, you don't have to answer, but uh, you definitely have to let it into your heart. Anyone ever have trouble trusting their attraction? I don't just mean the looks of the opposite sex when you're dating. I mean much, much more than that. I mean on a very, very deep level, our neshamas are naturally, they naturally cling to certain things. How easy is it to just uh, trust your nose? Meaning to trust, like we say in the nose, meaning what smells to you that this is for me or this is right, this is the right way. How easy it is, is it for us to trust our attraction, what we're attracted to? That which we're naturally, we naturally feel like, Zabishvili, this is for me. And how often is it very, very difficult to trust your attraction? So it's a question that, it's a question to really think about for a long time, do like a lot of Hidbon and Nut on it, to really to really tap into what that means, what is like, what are, you ask yourself, wait a second, what am I attracted to? And then you start looking at the things you're attracted to, and then you start asking, well, why am I attracted to them? Which will lead us to the question <coughs> I, I asked all of you last week, which was, do any of you know why, why you're here tonight? Do any of you know why you you're really involved in Yiddishkeit. Do any of you know why you're involved with that which you're involved in? Besides, I, I believe this is the right thing. That's, that's the ultimate. But until you get there, there's a few shlavim. Trusting your attraction, getting to really know yourself in the deepest depths, knows, means that that which I'm naturally turned on to and cling to, that is right for my neshama. And sometimes, like we learn with Yitro, you have to go through every single Avodah Zara in the world until you know that this is for you. And Rabbi Shlomo said, that's a, that's a fool, but that's a fool that at the end of the day, he'll make it somewhere. Because he won't stop until he feels at home with that which he chose. I had a friend in Los Angeles. She told me that she, she went through a lot of different spiritual experiences, but one time when she, she made it on here on a trip to Israel, and she was walking through the old city, I think, and she walked into a shul. Uh, you know what? She was almost also one of your daughter-in-laws. Actually, I can think about it. Yeah. So, she, this is poor. I'm like trying to stay serious. I thought like, okay, we're going to stick very real tonight. Anyway, so she walked into a shul and they started singing Rip Shlomo melodies and she burst out in crazy tears. And she said, she said, I never heard these melodies before, but I knew that I was home. 
I knew that I was home. Mishkan, Rabbi Nachman says, comes from the word Moshcheni. Draw, pull me, bring me closer. What, what, what words do we know with Moshcheni? Moshcheni acharecha. What's the next words anyone know? Venarutza. What does that mean? Moshcheni acharecha. Pull me after you. Venarutza. And then me and you will start running together. I want to talk about that for a second. Because that really is what Mishkan, was, the Mishkan was meant for. Not just Shochen, that it's a dwelling place, but that there's this going on. There's a drawing. You ever have a person in, in your life that you feel like every interaction with them, oh, wait, wait a second, also mouth to to Jack. Sorry, your birthday. Happy birthday. Mm-hmm. Oh, Not everyone was here. <laughs> I'm just not the one that kept. It doesn't, I'm, you, you were, yeah. But I'm like, you know, uh, not to embarrass anyone, I'm drawn to Jack. I'm drawn to Jack's thoughts. I'm drawn to Jack's uh, uh, questions. Like, we're not just talking about that, you know, you're drawn to a person's general feel. Certain things about a, pe- about a person can draw you to them. This inyan of drawing. Now, we say, Moshcheni acharecha venarutza. Draw me after you. Draw me to come and to come closer to you. And then venarutza, we will together start running. What does that mean? How many people here have a chavrusa? Now, how many people here have a life chavrusa? My chavrusa put me to the test this week. He said, you think you're my chavrusa? Only if you do this are you my chavrusa. He put me to the, he put me to the test this week. But what's a chavrusa? A chavrusa is someone who you're drawn to not just be with them, but you're drawn to do the art of running to God in this world together with. A chavrusa is not somebody who's going to slow you down. We're not talking about learning skills. We're talking about the drawing, the getting closer together. And that's why we have a saying in Chazal, O Chevrusa, O Mitusa, which means, really, if you don't have a running mate in life, a learning mate, but like a running mate in life, O Mituta, O Mavet, or death. Why? Because not running and being stale, Omed, isn't like, that's not really life. Life is just halacha, walking. And for that, to walk, to run, you need a chavrusa, someone that's drawn to what you're drawn to. That thing which they're also drawn to. Now, what did we learn? Oh, last week we were learning this, something very deep. We were learning about how the whole point of a minion is that you're supposed to daven together with people that are crying over that which you're davening for, which you're crying for as well. Like, that was the whole point. And diving together with people is not like, okay, we need ten to fit a count. No, we need ten, an assembly of ten men, who together, ten, and, and with Hashem, also women should not feel at all that it's just about the ten men. That's why I always say, by the way, that, you know, women, and there are some women, and I, and I encourage it more, and when we dive in Marev, I, I get so happy when there are a few women here that dive in Marev here. It's so important. It's not anymore just about ten men. You need ten men to fulfill a halachic obligation, but you definitely need ten women with the ten men to fulfill the inyan of what we're learning about, which is that people should be davening together that are crying over the same thing. Ten chavrusas davening together. Moshcheni acharecha, a minion of Moshcheni acharecha, draw me closer to you, venarutza, and we'll start running now. Tonight's going to be really sweet. The learning, it's only... Single lev, pay attention. This is it. A few, pa- how much? Three, four paragraphs, nothing. But what Reb Shlomo <coughs> does is that he explains to us why the Mishkan, based on the word Moshcheni, draw me closer, according to Rabbi Nachman, what about the Mishkan? What exactly about the Mishkan, the dwelling place of the Shechina, what about it is so perfect for the ending of Sefer Shmot. Why do we need Dafka, the Indian of Sefer Shmot? To end? Why do we need the book of... I mean, Sefer, there was a lot going on here. Just to remind you, there were ten plagues. There was the crossing of the Red Sea. There was the giving of the Torah, where everyone heard God, Amisra heard God's voice. There was the mana falling down from heaven. There was a Malik. 
there was the golden calf. There was Moshe Rabbeinu bringing down the 13 attributes of mercy. And there's a lot of in-between also. Truma, Tetzave, Mishpatim, a lot of Tachlis stuff, hardcore stuff. But we end off again with the Mishkan. Moshchini Yacharecha Ben Why? Mazek Kashur. What does this have to do? What exactly? Why are we ending Sefer Shmot talking about the Mishkan? It's not exactly about the Mishkan itself, but what it took to create the Mishkan. And that's what we're going to be learning about tonight. Okay. Very short, very sweet piece. Do we need more in the back? That question in Pasha Vaigra, could it be? I mean, I'm presuming it was somewhere around yeah, there. Probably, yeah. All right, everyone got? <gasps> Jael, you got. Okay, great. Sham Yechel, it's only one page. Oh, you need one? You need one more? All right, share clock, everyone. All right, so look at this. And just look at the title that we chose, so Moshe, what struck you the most on that mountain? Meaning, okay, Moshe Rabbeinu, beyond just, beyond just bringing down the Torah, what else happened to you while you were on Har Sinai? What do we know about Moshe Rabbeinu's transformation, being on Mount Sinai? What do we know? What do we know from the Torah about what took place in Moshe Rabbeinu's personal, private life while he was on Mount Sinai? Do we know anything? Well, we know physical things. Lechem lacha. You know, he didn't, he didn't eat bread, he didn't drink water. But what do we know? He had put on a mask. Because he was like... His face like, was light. His face was shining bright, right? So he put on a masveh. But what does that tachlis mean about what he went through on an emotional level? Do we know? He was in the presence of Hashem for 40 days and 40 nights. Great. You're, you've also been in the presence of Hashem. What does that mean? Well, I'm not really aware. He really was. So he was fully aware. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you guys to go deeper. My Rabbeinu was fully aware of being in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. What happens to a person when they're fully aware of being in the presence of God? Sorry? They don't sin. They don't sin, but they become perfect? Oh, you fall apart. You, know, you hit overload. <laughs> you hit overload? <laughs> what else, Chavir? I'm drawing out tonight. Moshcheni. I'm drawing. Draw people to you. Huh? They draw people to you. That after the... Hashem. No, no, no. Forget, forget everybody else. Forget what, forget what you cause. Forget the attraction. That's true. Of course you do. Hopefully. What happens to an actual, what happens to you inside, to you yourself, when you're fully aware that you're in the presence of God? Uh, full clarity. You change. You transform. You'll do, any, you'll do anything. You'll, you'll do anything to keep that up. You'll do anything to hold on to that moment. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's 9 p.m. I always do this to you guys, but it's good. It's 9 p.m. I want you all to think about your lives in the last four, no, let's go a little bit more, last 10 hours, okay? The last 10 hours, since 11 a.m. Did anyone here, and it's not Gaiva to say yes to this question, don't, you, you, know, you don't even have to raise your hands, just think about this. Were there any moments today of feeling like you're in the presence of the Rebona Shnala? See, if I'd ask you, did you, did you believe in God today, you'd say yes. But if I ask you if you felt like you were in the presence of God, it's not, an e it's not as easy an answer as, as, the, as the first question. 
which means that we see a big par, a big um, yeah, gap. gap between believing in God and experiencing God. Huge par, a huge gap. Okay, Moshe Rabbeinu experienced the Ribbon Shalayan, and Reb Shlomo will now explain to us what does it mean to experience Hashem. Not just to believe in Hashem, but like Jack said, the full awareness. To be fully aware, this is what's going on tonight. The Gemara says, the Moshe Rabbeinu, the Midrash says this too, the, the Gemara says based on the Midrash, the Gemara says that Moshe Rabbeinu put the tabernacle together, and it fell apart every day for a week. And only at the end of the week, it stayed together. Meaning he would put the Mishkan up, it would fall down, at the end of the day he'd have to put it back again to, together. And in fact, it was I saw another opinion. I saw another opinion. Oh, I probably gave that page out by accident. <laughs> yeah, it could be. I, I saw this other Midrash. A very, yeah, thank you. I think it's this. That Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa says, Rabbi Hanina says that it actually was three, it was three times a day. That every single day, you have to understand, uh, was the putting the Mishkan together like taking like 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 Mr. Potato Head and like fitting in four pieces and you're done? Putting the Mishkan together, how many how many times have we been learning in the Torah about Amavachetzi, Amataim Vachetzi, Adanim, Kikar Adanim? There's so many different intrinsic parts to building the Mishkan. Every day, Moshe Rabbein would have to put it together. And who was the, who was the architect of the Mishkan? The Chacham Lev B'Tzalel. Moshe Rabbein was the one to actually put all of that together. And every day, they would... They would so there's an opinion that says, no, it didn't happen twice, it happened three times a day. Three times a day for seven days comes out to 21 times. It was being erected, fell down, put it back together again. 21 is the Gematria Eheyeh, which was the name that God said, if you, a- if you ask me, if, if Am Yisrael asks you, what's my name, tell them Eheyeh, which means I will be, right? So on a very, let's just go very, you know, Rav Ginsburg style deep right now for a second, what does that mean? It means God's name equal 21, 21 times that it took to build something, break it down, rebuild it, break it down. You want to know what God's name is? God's name is not... Hmm, God's name is not quiet perfection. God's name is... God's name is... Oh, it's such a beautiful melody to that. God's name is, I bring a, I get married. And then a few months later, uh, was I supposed to do the dishes? God's name is, you bring a baby into the world. And then eight months later, nonstop. What does Eheye mean? 21. What does Eheye mean? God's name means, I will be, it means... It means what we're going to be learning right now. I know that was very, very not clear. It'll get clear right now, I just said. Again, the Gemara says, the Maish Rabbeinu put the Mishkan together and it fell apart every day for a week and only at the end of the week it stayed together. Friends, keeping it together is no simple thing on any level. You know, I always encourage people to remember the following thing. It's a lifesaver. When you come into, you know, what we call like spiritual kasach with your mate, how do you say, what's spiritual kasach? It's like, a, <laughs> how do you say spiritual kasach? It's like a, when the energies are mamish, like, you know, huh? when the clash of the, yeah, you know, when the clash of what clash happened, you have to understand that um, if the Ribbonu Shtaylam put you together in this world, for everything to be, hmm, you would have nothing to do in this life. There would be nothing. There would be nothing for you to do. You'd be so bored of the peace. Look what happens in Israeli media when two days go without some kind of a crazy political scandal or chas v'chalila pigua. 
people don't know what to do. They, they start writing the most hazurim or insane things in the paper because what are we supposed to do without the drama? So whenever there's drama, whenever there's, that's like Tumadik drama, holy, holy, holy drama, means that our, our, our forces were, were clashing, but that's because something bigger is going on. Hashem puts you in this world not to see how much things can stay peaceful in your life. Hashem puts you in this world to see how much can you keep things together after they fall. Not once, not twice. Sheva yipol tzadik v'kam. Literally, Sheva yipol tzadik v'kam, Dover HaMelech says. The tzadik falls seven times and then he, he gets up again. This is, I think it's based on this thing in the Mishkan that it kept on falling down for seven days, but then it was, it was erected and it stayed together. So the Shlomo says keeping it together is no simple thing on any level. And now, let's pat ourselves on the back instead of usually feeling when I ask certain questions that we're the lowest of the low. Now, let's pat ourselves on the back. Who here has kept something together in their life? If you're, if you're, if you're here right now, you have something together. You have something together, whether you like it or not. It's true. All those things that you woke up this morning thinking that today I'm going to do, I didn't do. Yeah, could be. I'm, I, I, I'm the king in that. I'm just letting you all know. Sorry, I beat everyone on that one. For me to like cross off the list is like the heart, you know, just the list keeps on getting longer and longer every single day. We have our pekalach, like my friend Pesach told me a few weeks ago, the pekalach are growing on trees these days, mamish everywhere. There's more and more pekalach and baggage. We have it together. On a certain level, we have it together. We've kept it together in our life. We've gone through stuff that we never ever imagined we would go through and come out alive, and we've kept it together. And each person, that means something else, like if there's no way I could do that. Think of what you thought once in your life. Oh, no, there's no way I could get through that. You kept it together. Whatever it is. Now, let me ask you, friends, what's the... Now, he's going to answer a very important question. What's the acid test if you mamish have it together inside? How do you know if you really... Inside? Yes, and, and when I say have it together, you know what I mean? It means that you have the kalim, that you have the vessels to deal with that which Kadosh Baruch Hu puts on your plate. It's a very good question. How do I know if I have the vessels to deal with my mana, with my port, with what God put on my plate? How do I know if I can do it? How do I know if I'm built for it? Look at the answer. It's beautiful. Very simple. If you don't have it together, you give up when it falls apart. If you really have it together inside, you don't ever give up. I'm going to read that line again. Please listen with your heart right now, okay? And, and, and listen, see your life in this answer, okay? See, look at your own life and look at it inside. If you don't have it together, you give up when things begin to fall apart. If you really have it together inside, you don't ever give up. Uh, you know, before, before I remember there was once a really hard tkufa in my life that I, I said to God, as things started to crumble, I said, if you think I could get through this, we're not on the same page. If I, if this, if I actually, if this is going to fall apart, I'm leaving and I'm becoming a painter in Manchester. I don't know why I thought about that. I said, I'm going to start painting houses in Manchester and start like singing folk songs in, 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 in bars in Manchester. I said, because I can't imagine that it's within me to keep it together right now because this, whatever it was, resembled everything. And if this wasn't going to happen, and if this was going to fall apart, this mahalach in life, I can't keep it together. There's nothing left to keep together. And um, I still do wonder what it would be like to be a, a, a singer in bars in Manchester. It, it does interest me. I, I have no idea. I don't know why. You know, I think I know why. At the time, I was listening to a lot of Stephen Stills, and he was hanging out with Jimi Hendrix um, before Jimi took off. That's what was happening. And I think I had just gotten hold of a recording of them playing in a bar in Manchester. L'chaim. 
<laughs> I can't explain it any other way. You know, nothing else makes sense to me. I, 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 Emma's, Emma's Manchester? No, no, okay, okay, okay. That, that accent drives me absolutely insane. So I, I wasn't saying that I'm like, I can't wait to go to Manchester. This guy in yeshiva, he kept on talking to me in English, and I needed a translator because that <laughs> accent was driving me nuts. Anyway, is anyone here from Manchester? Last night I got into trouble. We learned a whole piece of Torah about, <laughs> about the danger of certain, certain trend in psychology and about psychologists. And, <laughs> and a woman came up to me after the class and she said, Hi, I'm a psychologist, like that. I was like, oh no, listen. <laughs> he, said this in, he said this 42 years ago. Trust me, things have changed, things have progressed. So... Manchester accents haven't really changed. They only, they've only gotten a bit more harsh. But for mo- whatever it is, anyway, it's not important at all. It's not important at all. No, <laughs> it's good. We said, we said crazier things last night. <laughs> it's fine. But in any event, we think that there's certain things in life that when before we go through them, there's no way in the world we think we could keep our marbles together. We don't think we could actually go through them. But I want us all, right now, to going into Purim, and poor me wipe out a malik, and we always think, oh, I can't really wipe out a malik, I'll wipe out a little bit of bad in my life. To wipe out evil totally? Who am I? I can't do that. Give ourselves a pat on the back for one second. Each of us has been through our own Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Each of us has had to make, in today's day and age, there's no such thing as a person that doesn't have to make very hard decisions in life. I don't care if you're 17, or you're 48, or you're 74. It doesn't matter, the age has nothing to do with it. What has to do with it was, have you been able to keep your life together? I'm not talking about shame. I'm not talking about staying the same. I want to make sure this is clear. I'm not saying, hey, have you been able to hold your composure and always stay the same through whatever you go through in life? No. Hopefully you always evolve and you change and you get deeper. But have you been able to kind of keep life together? Like things have crumbled and you re-erect that which has fallen, even though it fell down again every single day. You keep on trying. Eretz Yisrael is the best example. It doesn't make any sense that after the six million are killed, we come back to Eretz Yisrael and we have so much trouble. It doesn't, just doesn't make any sense. If you tell someone while they're in the gas chambers, listen, I can't give you any consolation but the fact that six million Jews will be living in Eretz Yisrael in 60 years from now. But then you tell them, but the truth is, we'd be f- we would be keep on offering back and forth Jerusalem, and hundreds and thousands of Jews will keep on getting killed for the next 60 years. This doesn't add up. But somehow, because of Moshe Rabbeinu's avoda of the Mishkan, you and I don't give up. And we can't explain it. If we'd stop right now, and I would take you on a very personal journey in your life, and ask very private, intimate questions about things that really hurt. And I'd ask you, let me ask you a question. When you went through that, why didn't you give up? What kept you going? If you can say what it is that kept you going, it doesn't turn me on so much. If it's something like that you can't explain, then I can relate to you. Because most things that keep us going and not giving up in life are not things that you could really verbalize and explain. It's something bigger. It's something that has to do with Moshe Rabbeinu. It's something that has to do with being aware and being in the presence of God. If, any, if you're going through whatever you're going through in life and you never had the privilege of being in the presence of the Rebona Shleinam, you couldn't keep on going. There's no way. So whether you realize it or not, there have been many moments in your life that you've experienced God. And those are the most firm religious moments of your life. You're just not told that it is. Because you're told that this is the most firm experience of your life. But the truth is, that place of being aware that you're in the presence of the Rebona Shalaylam is the only juice that really kept your batteries flowing. Whether you like it or not. That's what kept you going. How many people left a Fabrengen from the Rebbe? And you'd ask them, after standing there like sardines for four or five hours, how was it? Oh my God. It was 
just, I, I can't even say what it was. Really, what did the Rebbe say? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> but it was the highest thing in the world. How many of my friends that I, I see them in pictures that they were with Rip Shlomo in certain places and certain classes that, you know, it takes us like three years to begin to understand what he's talking about. And they were there when it was happening live. And I would always ask them, so what, what did he say? And they all said, look, I don't remember any of it, but it was the highest. And they mean it. Why? Because they were in the presence of the Ribbon HaShalei. And when you're in the presence of God, the experience does not need words. It's something much, much greater. We're always looking for definitions. We're always looking for explaining why I feel what I feel. When I let go of that, I have a Mishkan in my life. Okay, let's continue. Take a look at Aras Yidin. How is it that we were away for 2,000 years from the Holy Land and we never gave up? Like, where does that come from? Because there's one thing we have together. Maybe we don't have Shabbos together. But the Holy Land, Eretz Yisrael, give out. Nobody can take it away from us. Rabbi Shalom once said something very deep. He says, what's holier, Eretz Yisrael or Shabbos? What's holier? Shabbos is just once a week, right? Eretz Yisrael is always. So it's not really fair to say what's holier. I don't know what's holier, but what's more on a permanent level as opposed to a sometimes level? One day it'll be that Shabbos is like Eretz Yisrael, always. Yom Shekulo Shabbat. But we have Eretz Yisrael. God's name is always, Eretz Yisrael is always there. So he says, we always have, nobody can take it away from us. What happens to you when you stand by the Holy Wall in Yerushalayim? <coughs> Maybe you'll still eat a hamburger next to Yom Kippur. Maybe. But you know what will happen to you? Something inside of you has it together. Yerushalayim <laughs> has, this in, has this energy that once you're there, you, maybe you don't take on everything in life, and maybe like, you didn't become this perfect religious Jew. Who cares? It's not our cheshbon. It's everyone's cheshbon on their own. What happens to you? Your awareness is different. I remember when, I, when my family moved back to Los Angeles, when I was in the middle of my junior year in high school. Actually, right around now. It was Parshat Pekude Vayikra. It was, no, it was, it was right before Purim. So yeah, literally right now, in 1997. <clears throat> You know, growing up in Israel in the early 90s, mid-90s, we grew up, we, we went to funerals. The head of my, the komonar in my sneef in Bnei Akiva, his name was Hillel, I forgot his last name, a gibor, killed in Lebanon. I never forget this, and the, the, the Kav Shmona I remember there was two attacks on the 18 in Yerushalayim. So for some reason, it was two Sundays, right? Sunday after Sunday, or two weeks in between, whatever it was. I mean, I never forget it, that, that I went with my, with my friends, I ditched school to go and look at the burning, the, the, the bus that was shattered, because it was still there, and I, till today I even, I found it, I have a, I have a, I have like a wire off of that bus. Now, I moved back to L.A. a few months later, and I, and I am from L.A., and I still had all my friends that I grew up with as a kid, I felt like I was walking in Jupiter. Mm. Not because LA is so tumidic. It is, obviously. <laughs> but that's not that's not that's not why. It's because we just think differently. You just the, the awareness that happens here in Eretz Israel, mm -hmm. it, it's two different and my last thought. There's nothing you can do. And and it's not about blame that their fault, not their fault. It's a fact of life. As much as, you know, when I travel, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to still be connected to Eretz Yisrael. I'll check Ynet every few hours. I'll be in touch. It doesn't matter. It's a different, it's mamish the air. It's a different ball game. The awareness is different. So yeah, maybe people come here and they don't change their whole beings. But you know what they have inside? When, what does the awareness cause you? That you can keep your act together on a certain level. That something in you is different. Your, your, your mechanics are just, it's a different ballgame. It's something else. 
Okay. Now, this is the bottom, not the bottom of, the, of this paragraph. But you see what it is. Only Moshe Rabbeinu can put it together. And on this recording that Reb Shlomo says this, he said this, these words, I just remember, he said these words in March of 1991. Now, why do I remember this? I was 11. I don't remember it. I remember when I got the tape, and I remember, oh, this is very interesting. Because he said this during the yard site of his twin brother. You know, he had a twin brother. He had a twin brother who passed away four and a half years before he did. And uh, also heart problems. And a year later, Reb Shlomo on the yard site, he came to Long Beach, California, where one of his twin, one of his nieces, one of his twin brother's daughters was living. And he did a whole concert in that area. And he spoke about, like, what does it mean to, to erect a family and keep it together? So he was saying only Moshe Rabbeinu was the one who could have looked at something falling apart two, we see here now three times a day in the Mishkan, and still believe that that has nothing to do with keep with, with trying again. Like Yeush, like Rabbi Nachman says, En shum Yeush ba'olam klal, there's no such thing as despair. It was like a very living, living, breathing thing in Moshe Rabbeinu's life, which really, where did he get that from? He got that when he was on Mount Sinai. Why? What do we see about Moshe Rabbeinu's correspondence with God until Har Sinai? Whenever God talks to him, you see a lot of doubt in Moshe Rabbeinu. How do I know? How do I know I could be the leader? What if they don't listen to me? What are you going to do with them? What's it going to be like? When he's on Mount Sinai, it's not that he comes down with an awareness that everything is perfect is that he comes down with conviction. And how do we know he came down with conviction? Because it takes a lot of conviction to talk to God and say, if you don't do this, then blot me out of your book. That takes conviction. Awareness of God is conviction. Is that I am now, you appeared in my life. It's not just that I could say I had a godly moment. It's so that I could look at my challenges in life. It's so that I could look at all the things that fall and crumble and say, wait a second, Azma, I'm going to rebuild it again. And I'm going to rebuild it again. And I'm going to keep on rebuilding. Because the fact that something fell has nothing to do with its chances of lasting the next time. Nothing to do with it. We look at life and we say, hmm, well, what doesn't work? That thing I kept on trying to... If it's not something that is godly, that is awareness of the Kaddish Baruch Hu, so maybe that thing will last, maybe it won't. But when it has to do with Kedusha, with your own Mishkan, with your own Avodah Hashem, working on your Midos, so and now let's get very personal, each of us has taken upon ourselves certain things to work on, to try to really perfect, to try to really correct a certain Midah, a certain trait. And I don't know anybody that took upon themselves something but didn't have to keep on retaking it upon themselves once it, for, in order for it to last. I don't know anyone like that. I don't know anyone like that. And I could be wrong. Maybe each of you has taken something upon yourselves and it never crumbled and you never had to rebuild it. But if it's coming from a place of being in aware and conscious of going through an experience with the Ribbon Shneidam, I hate to sound very like cheesy, but you can really do anything. You can really do anything in the world. If you welcome the presence of the Rebona Shalaylam into your child's bedroom each night when you say Shema Yisrael with your child, they will grow up being con with the conviction, with, with the clear notion that they can do anything in this world. Rabbi Shlomo said, all children want is that the people that put them to sleep to believe that tomorrow they could excel. That's all children really want. So how much do you have to invite your Bonish Shleilam to the bedroom every night? And how much do you have to invite your Bonish Shleilam into your, into your Shabbos table, husband and wife? It, it's, it's into everything in life. When the Kotzker Rebbe says, where is God, wherever you let him in, that's what it means. It means to wherever you let the awareness of the experience of the Rebona Shleilam. I hate to say, I really hate to say bad things right now. Most of us in here, many of us, grew up with, with what's called religious education. And you all know, obviously, what I'm going to ask you next. About 
experiencing God through Jewish religious curriculum. It's, a, it's, it, it's, it's sad. It's scary. It's a very weird thing that, like, in the Chinuch system, is like a person has the precious, incredible opportunity to mechanech 30, 35 kids. It's like, we, we expect one person to instill within 35 little children the experience of God. So we throw 35 kids into a room just because that's what people do, because that's the system. It has to change. Again, but you see what it is? Only Moshe Rabbeinu can put it together. And do you know why Moshe Rabbeinu can put the Mishkan together? Because together, meaning keeping it together, is the teaching from heaven. It's not from this world. Like, you do need kalim, you need vessels. It's a very big thing now, people that are trying, beginning to understand that light, we have plenty of light coming down all the time. And we have access to all the tzaddikim more than we ever had. What to do with the teachings is a whole other ballgame. The teachings exist. What to do with them is a tremendous thing. So we're seeing, especially in Breslov, we're seeing a lot of different schools of thought now that are saying, also in Lubavitch, we're seeing a lot of schools of thought that are saying, okay, let's figure out what to do with all this huge light that's pouring down from Shemaim. But really, to keep all of it together, you can only do that, it's nothing to do with the manual, and no one can really tell you play by play how to do this, how to keep your life together. It's the invitation, it's inviting the presence of the Rebona Shalaylam into your life. Remember the Ishbitzer says, what does holy mean? Holy means that you're ready to be a servant of Hashem at any given second. That's what holiness means. How do we know this? This is so deep. Listen to this. I say this almost every chuppah. It's such an important thing. Is that when, we, uh, when a chassan says to the kala, Hare at mekudesh, behold, you are sanctified unto me, it means that I am sh telling you right now that I'm going to be ready for you at any given second because I know that you're ready for me at any given second. How do we know this? That that's the interpretation of holiness? Because a very weird pasuk, you know, what does Hashem expect from us? When God says, Kedoshim ti yu ki kadosh ani, that's a pretty big expectation. Be holy unto me, because I'm holy. And thank God the Me'ashilach said, kadosh means to be ready to be giving, to be ready to be present. So God says, Kedoshim ti yu, be present, be ready for me. Be ready for my experience in this world. Why? Ki kadosh ani, God says. Because God is always ready for us. Hashem is always ready for us. Hashem is always present when I need Him. You ever have an experience that you started saying, like you actually said, I'm going to start pouring out my heart to God, but you felt like uh, no one's there. Not if, not if you're really talking. Karov Hashem l'chol korav l'chol asher yikre'u be'emet. If you're calling out to the Yibbana Shalom for real, He's always there. Moshe Rabbeinu experienced Kedusha on Har Sinai. That he saw that God is present, and he realized that He is present. What are the two words now we can connect something beautiful we once learned? How do we know this even deeper? Because Moshe Rabbeinu is told by God, Ale Elai Hahara, and then what are those two words? Vehayesham, and be there. Mamash be there. Be there, be present. And when Moshe Rabbeinu is present, he can come back down, he can smash Luchos, and he can still think, that everything can be fixed. Why? Because he had one second of his life being in the presence of God. That's all you need. And before I said before, like, that that nigun that we sang before was like air for me. It keeps you going. It's because certainly nigunim, you feel like you're in the presence of God. And those are usually 
nigunim that don't have words. It's very interesting. Usually the nigunim without words are the ones that really bring this awareness, this consciousness of the Rebona Shleilam into the world. It's a gift from heaven. It's, it's a taste of what Moshe Rabbeinu experienced on, on Mount Sinai. Remember the story that Rebbe Lavorker, the silent Rebbe, he, he, he one time with his chassidim, like he would barely speak and they once sat for hours together. They didn't say a word. And at the end, I think he said, Hashem Hu Elohim. And each person felt like they learned everything about their own lives after the Rebbe said that. Yeah, another story. The Ish Kodesh. So he had a crazy story. His son was, was injured in a bombing which took place in the ghetto right before Sumchas Taira and Cholom Sukis and he succumbed to his wounds right before Yantiv. And the Hasidim, whoever was there, you know, everyone was his Hasid in the ghetto. And, and, and when he walked in, finally they waited, he finally walked in to speak to share his heart, Simchas Taira night, so he waited for a long time. He didn't say one word. And then he gets up and he says, after, I don't even know how long, he says, Baruch es Hashem HaMevarach. And everyone screamed back, Baruch Hashem HaMevarach Le'olam Va'ed. And everyone felt that they did their tikkun in this life, even. Because of experiencing being in the presence of God. Anyone that goes to Uman for real comes back and they can't tell you what they felt. If they can explain to you, it's not it. It's just not it. And they know. They'll understand it later on. And they even know that which I can't explain is giving me batteries. So how does that work? I can't even explain it. But why is that my juice? How does that work? Because, like Rabbi Shlomo just says, because together, keeping it together, feeling like you can keep it, your act together, is the teaching from heaven, not from this world. It's not from the tree of knowledge, Rabbi Shlomo says. It's from the tree of life. You have to mamish be up there. Moshe Rabbeinu brought down the man, Moshe gave us the Torah, but what is Moshe Rabbeinu really teaching us at the end of the Book of Redemption, at the end of Sefer Shmot? He brings down the Torah of how to get it together. Eile pikudei mishkan, mishkan ha'edut. What is the mishkan called? The dwelling place of testimony. What does it mean, the mishkan ha'edut? What, is it, what do you mean you have to give over testimony? Any of us right now that still have our lives somewhat together, we are walking a din that God exists. We are a dut. We are mishkan a dut. We are, we are mamash. Those of us today that still mom are holding on to God, we are walking pillars of the mishkan. Mishkan a dut. The mishkan which gave testimony that what? That when you taste your bonus line, when you have awareness that that you can do anything, you don't even have to talk about it, you don't have to go around giving shears, giving lectures about how God exists. You're a walking testimony. You're not just a walking testimony that Jews still exist, oh, the Germans didn't get us. That, that, that doesn't work anymore for this generation. Look at us, we're still chai v'kayam. That's not what's keeping this generation alive. What's keeping this generation alive is that we took a look at ourselves and we're like, wow, we are made out of something that we can't explain. We can't explain it. Thank God we can't explain it. Explaining something is the tree of knowledge, like Rabbi Shlomo said. The tree of life, being on Har Sinai, the Hayeshama, being there, Mashuacher, something else. And this, Rabbi Shlomo says, this is the end of the book of Exodus. This is the end of Shmot. Why? Now look how in his master, master way of, of explaining things. Why is this the end of Shmot? Why does Shmot end like this? Because, and what's Shmot all about? It's about leaving slavery, right? Because if you don't have it together, you're still in exile. 
you're still a slave. What does that mean? That you're still what does it mean that you're still in exile if you don't have it together? What do you guys think it means? Now let's answer. If you don't have what together, you're still a slave. Anyone. Your if life. huh? Your your pekalach. Yeah. Your baggage. What? If you don't have a sense that Hashem is present in your life. If you don't have a sense that the Rebbe Nishlam is present in your life, what else? If you don't have what together, then you're still a slave. Wait, why are you a slave if you don't have a sense of, a, of Hashem being present in your life? It's funny, most people that, that I know that aren't so observant seem to be much more free than us from Jews who are slaves to all these different talachas, right? No? I'm asking a stupid question, obviously, but you hear what I'm saying. Yeah. We have to understand that, that being free, like being really religious, being observant, means freedom. You know, take it or leave it. Moshe Feiglin's whole thing right now is Yahadut equals Chirut. Yahadut equals freedom. Mm -hmm. no, not freedom to do whatever you want. <laughs> free to serve the Rebbe Nishtayim the way that you know is right. Freedom in that way. It's freedom to make the choice. Freedom to make the choice. There are different kinds of compulsions. Halakha is a compulsion that you accept. We have other compulsions that compel us. That's slavery. Right. We're, both people are slaves to freedom when the freedom isn't real. You're, you're a slave to freedom. You're a slave to the fact that you can do whatever you want. I was just a slave to it. Keeping it together means that I can't do whatever I want, but that's my choice. And I'm so happy that, that I've invited God into my free choice. That I've brought that which is supposedly is supposed to constrict and set laws and make things very shapey and not free. I've invited that energy into what seems to be like I can do whatever I want. It's, it's what we call the celebration of Bechira Chofshit Mamash. Celebrating free will. So as we're ending right now, Sefer Shmot, and we see the Mishkan, Moshe Rabbeinu every day, the whole week, 21 times, he puts it back together. It's because for us, for our love and our safety to dwell in a place in this world, you're going to have to keep, it'll, it'll keep on breaking. Like, I don't want to be a bearer of bad news to anybody, but let's be real. Um, we're, 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 we're going to keep on, things are going to keep on breaking in our lives. Like, Mashiach will come and won't. But Hashem, until Mashiach comes though, things are going to keep on, there, there's still going to be friction. But celebrate the fact that you can see that you can get through things in life. Invite, invite, invite God. Invite yourself. Forget about Rebbe Hashem for a second. How much were we present in our lives the last, I ask you about God? What about yourselves? How much were you present in your own life the last 10 hours? How many things did you just do because that's what life does, you just keep on going? You want to invite God, make sure God's present? You show up too. You make sure you're present as well. And that's how we end Sefer Shemot, and that's how we're ready now to do Vayikra, Korbanot, Lehit Karev. That's what sacrifices are. Korban is Melashon Kerva. You only get closer once you're close. That's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to create ultimate closeness, and that's what it means that Moshe Rabbeinu kept on bringing the Mishkan back together. We should, we should rejoice in the fact that you look at one time in your life where you thought, there's no way I can keep my act together, and you do. Let's sing this nigga one more time.
Besides the fact that Bina and I are, very, are just continuing to be humbled and honored and thrilled that we get to learn so much in our home. We feel this every Shabbos, what happens here, we always feel every single Shabbos, the Shabbos table, all week long, brings so much to our home. So, just ultimate thank you to everyone. We put out, Chaz De Hashem, the first two volumes of Bereshit, Evan Shlomo, and we put out the soul of Hanukkah this last year, which Chaz De Hashem, with no words, I can never, ever express how thankful I am to Kaddish Baruch Hu. And it's really gone, it's really, it's really opened up so many hearts. And Chaz De Hashem, we finished now the translation of the first two volumes in Hebrew. And it's also funded and it's coming out this summer. Evan Shlomo, both volumes in Hebrew, in, in one volume. We've also, Baruch Hashem, the next Sefer is coming out this summer. And it, for me, it's the most important thing I ever had the schuss of working on. It's called the soul of Yerushalayim. And it's, it will be more or less close to 280 or 300 pages of Torah of Reb Shalom about the Beis HaMignash. Uh, I remember when I first started working on that dafka, this, it was shivers down my spine because every teaching I felt most, and those of you who have been, you know, we've had the highest learnings during the three weeks and nine days the last few years. So, the next Sefer is the soul of Yerushalayim. And I have to put it out, because I want us all to start davening ready from now, that it should really reach all the hearts in the world that should go out there. And obviously, we need help with sponsors for this as well. This takes a lot. It's, it's so much more than just giving a manuscript. It's a lot, a lot of work. And to do it right, we have to do it kavadik. We have to do it right. Mamash right. Mamash kavadik. If anyone can help or anyone knows people can help, would like to sponsor. So far there's one. We need two more to really take this to the next level. And also, what we're working on right now is also we're halfway done with Evan Shlomosh on Shmot. We're finishing Shmot, so I have to say it right now. Which will hopefully, if we can get enough funding, will be out by the next cycle of, of learning Parshat Shmot. And we auction off every single Parsha for a donation. And so far, one out of the Sefer Shmot has, been, has already been taken. And I don't want to wait for the last second, and I want to give the opportunity, Dafka, to those Chavar that do learn with us, if they want to sponsor, or they want to help out in any way, shape, or form with this. Tavo Bracha. Trust me. It's the most unnatural thing for me to even talk like this. Trust me. But the halacha says, in, uh, you know, no one else is going to be doing this, so I have to just share this. So, Bezot Hashem, the gates will open, and I'm sure these things will be get, pu get published. It's just a matter of who wants it, who wants it badly enough. So, Alevai, we should all feel that it's the luckiest chus in the world we should continue to feel that we are the luckiest people in the world, but to be able to help to share this lucky, this Torah, Torah's Chaim with other people, Ashreinu Matov Chilkeinu. You can ask me any more, email me or talk to me about any other questions regarding this whenever you'd like. And Bezrat Hashem, we're learning this Thursday night in Yerushalayim. I'll send out an email about that. And we continue with next week, Sunday night in Simchat Shlomo, and Monday night back here in our house. Okay? So this Thursday in Yerushalayim, Sunday night also in Yerushalayim in Simchat Shlomo, and Monday night back here in our house, Parashat Vayikra. Okay? Shikach, everyone. Thank you for coming.